And um, let me ask you a question. I'm sure you you know this that the, you know, from the physiological point of view, we breathe spontaneously and we roughly take about 15 breaths a minute. We breathe at a tidal volume about four mils per kilo, and there is very small pressure change within our lungs. And we breathe 21% oxygen from this lovely air, and we have a PaO2 and a PCO2 normal, it's 140 millimeters of mercury. We all know that, but have you ever raised the question, why is it so? Why do we have to breathe spontaneously? Why is the tidal volume less? Why do we have a PaO2 of 100? And this answer is very simple, but very important, because it's good for us. Now, the, the analogy that anything else is not good for us. So this is going to be the focus of my talk for the next few minutes. <clears throat> Normally, uh, oxygenation takes place in an in alveoli like this one, uh, and your alveoli in this room are most likely to be open, so whenever the blood reaches it from the right ventricle, then it becomes oxygenated at some fraction of a second, and then the well-oxygenated blood leaves the alveolus. However, in our patients, there are alveoli which, are, uh, uh, which, which do not contain air, either because of atelectasis or with, with, they are filled with something, sputum or whatever. So in this case, the oxygen comes from the right ventricle, but doesn't get in touch with oxygen, so it leaves it unchanged, and we call this shunt. And when we see a hypoxemic patient, it's usually the mixture of the two, and it follows simple logic, that the more alveoli uh, fall out of uh, ventilation, then uh, the worse the PaO2, FI, the um, arterial oxygen content of the blood. Now there are two ways to handle this situation. One would be that you recruit those uh, alveoli which are out of ventilation, or the other one, the simple scenario that you give oxygen to the patient, and then you increase the uh, alveolar oxygen content, and you can increase uh, the, the uh, arterial oxygen content of your patient's blood. However, you cannot do that <clears throat> in every uh, severity of hypoxemia, because, as it is nicely shown on this isoshunt um, uh, diagram um, <clears throat> by John F. Nahn, if, uh, if the shunt increases 50%, so 50% of alveoli or more are out of uh, ventilation, then by simply increasing the FiO2, you cannot uh, treat hypoxemia. So we have to recruit the alveoli, we have to open the alveoli, and um, the um, measure to do that is for applying positive pressure to the lungs. But we have a therapeutic dilemma here. Uh, we all agree, I'm sure, that every injured organ or inflamed organ should be put at rest. We don't ask somebody with a fractured neck or femur to do push-ups. So we don't <clears throat> uh, give uh, Indian curry to patients with pan pancreatitis, and we don't um, we sedate patients with head injuries. So we put every organ at rest. And what we are doing with the lung? We are um, submitting the lung uh, unphysiological high pressures, but this is a necessity because it can save lives. And I don't think there is any other medical intervention which could show such a dramatic improvement in the mortality like what happened in 1952 in Copenhagen during the polio epidemic when this anesthetist, Björn Ibsen, was asked to intubate the patients and medical students were hand ventilating them and you can see that the mortality from 90% within a couple of months dropped down to 30%. I don't think any other medical intervention could show such a dramatic improvement. Now I am an anesthetist by training and I just recognize that uh, Dr. Lassen didn't put Björn Ibsen amongst the authors but this situation lingers on even nowadays that <coughs> we are kind of looked down uh, specialty. So anyway, going back to this slide, if we apply IPPV uh, incorrectly, then it can be a deadly weapon. Uh, this is a, a slide I uh, got from Gary F. Neiman. So what you can see here is a normal lung. And you can see the, uh, the lung assigne and the alveoli. The alveoli are open and they increase in size and decrease. Inspiration, expiration. Now this is a lung, a picture of a ARDS lung. <clears throat> And you, what you see here, that towards the end of the inspiration, the alveoli open up, but as the volume and the pressure drops, they close uh, down again. 
And this is something which on its own can be deadly to our patients. Uh, there are several physiological effects of uh, during ARDS and related to mechanical uh, ventilation, uh, both on the uh, within and uh, around the alveoli, and of course it is the alveolar capillary layer is also injured. There are serious inflammatory processes going on, and this caused uh, that complex picture. <clears throat> what we see in our patients with ARDS. Now, I use this uh, figure from Paolo Pelosi and Luciano Gattinoni to demonstrate uh, what we are doing during mechanical ventilation. This is a CT um, picture of a severely injured lung of a pig, and what, can you see, what you can see here is that when you increase the pressure, the aerated area is increasing, and at that time, the, full, uh, the lung is, is open. There are two inflection points, and uh, by and large, if you set your peak somewhere around here, and you set your peak inspiratory pressure somewhere around here, and you ventilate your patients between these two points, then there is a um, possibility that you can avoid a progressive atelectasis, and you can also prevent over-distension of the well-aerated <coughs> lung. And this is what is called the open lung concept, open up the lung and keep it open. And we apply lung protective ventilation since the Arts Network study published in 2000. But I have a question whether this 6 milliliter of per kilo tidal volume, uh, does it uh, fit all of our patients? And I pinched um, this, uh, this figure from, uh, from Marcelo Amato. And, but it is, a, it is a lovely slide because it shows that if you deliver the so-called protective lung volume, to a patient whose lung is open, then you generate a very small transpulmonary pressure. But if you deliver the same volume to the same patient, but the lung is severely atelectatic, and you deliver this volume into one lobe only, or, or a very small aerated area, then you can end up with a, a several fold higher transpulmonary pressure, and you can do harm. And in this uh, paper, uh, published two years ago, <clears throat> what, what they did, the authors, that they, they collected data from large arts uh, ARDS trials and they uh, created three subgroups. And in these subgroups, uh, the strategy was different. Uh, in the first subset, peak was constant and uh, the driving pressure was increased constant, uh, gradually. In these patients, the driving pressure was constant and the peak was increased, and here the, plateau, the peak pressure was set. Uh, as constant and the peak was increased and the, the um, driving pressure decreased towards the end. So, uh, <clears throat> and when they looked at mortality, they found that uh, uh, it wasn't the peak which uh, harmed the patients, but it was the driving pressure which had a significant relationship with mortality. So the message to me from this paper, that it's not the peak per se, but it's the delta pressure that we have to pay special attention to. Uh, however, <clears throat> we don't have data on lung recruitment in spontaneously breathing patients. So, um, <clears throat> because most of our patients, or my ICU at least, are in a CPAP pressure support mode, especially when we ventilate them longer, uh, this is a very interesting topic to me. Uh, now, there are pros and cons with uh, spontaneous breathing, and uh, first of all, spontaneous breathing is good for us. Uh, so it should be good for our patient. Uh, theoretically, it provides a better patient ventilation, ventilator synchrony, and it is advantageous hemodynamically. And <clears throat> there is better ventilation perfusion um, relationship because during spontaneously breathing patients, they move the dependent part of the diaphragm as compared to mechanical ventilation when the air goes yeah. mainly to the non-dependent part uh, to the upper parts, ventral parts of the lungs. So and this gives a better VQ ratio. And there is some experimental data, what I have already referred to earlier, that in these in pigs, uh, they were ventilated in APRV mode, and um, in one set of animals, uh, they, were, they had a maintained spontaneous breathing, and the other set of animals, they were without spontaneous breathing. And when you look at the CT scan data, you can see that the atelectasis was significantly bigger in those who did not breathe spontaneously. So it seems that spontaneous breathing is good for you. Now there are cons with spontaneous breathing. 
Normally, our transpulmonary pressure is it, it's less than, than 10 uh, centimeters of water. However, if our patients uh, are breathing spontaneously, but they have respiratory distress, and they are non-invasive ventilation, then this increased inspiratory effort can cause a severe, uh, several times uh, higher transpulmonary pressure, which on its own can be deleterious for our patients. So, <clears throat> um, going on, we, I, I estimate that there is good patient ventilator synchrony when the patient triggers the ventilator. But when you compare it to NAVA, neurally adjusted ventilatory assist, when the, 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 the trigger is basically detected in the vagal phrenic nerve rather than generating a diaphragmatic movement, then, as this nice study revealed, uh, the trigger delay, the ineffective efforts, the number of ineffective efforts, and the premature cycling was significantly uh, more frequent in the patients on pressure support ventilation as compared to NAVA. And this is an asynchrony index, the number of events per minute divided by the sum of triggered and non-triggered breaths. And uh, this was again significantly higher in these patients. And the dotted line represents what is considered severe asynchrony. This was also higher in that patients. And there is a recent meta-analysis uh, which is in accord with that that asynchrony index was significantly worse, higher in patients on pressure support as compared to NAVA ventilation. And the severe asynchrony was also significantly more frequent. So, uh, to sum this up, pressure support ventilation, it has physiological advantages, but we have to be aware there might be some problems. Now, uh, and this is the explanation of what we found in this paper we published uh, several years ago with my colleague uh, Andras Wobos, when um, we put the patients on a T-piece trial for uh, spontaneous breathing, and what we found, that on T-piece there was better PaO2 FiO2 ratio, and also the SCVO2 showed a significant uh, improvement, indicating that the patients were happier on T-piece as on uh, pressure support ventilation. <clears throat> now, uh, regardless, we decided to do a study, a lung recruitment study during spontaneous breathing. And the rationale was that if we go into, these were all patients with tracheostomy, so now in the long-term ventilation weaning phase, and uh, whenever we saw uh, lowish PaO2 or there is a need for higher FiO2, we consider theoretically that lung recruitment could be beneficial. If we increase pressure support, and there is an increase in tidal volume, this indicates, or should indicate recruitment, and if there is recruitment, then the shunt is decreased, and the PF ratio should increase, and therefore I can reduce FiO2, hence I push the patient towards what is good for him or her, because we, we are getting closer to physiological values. Now, let me use this uh, Gattinoni figure again to demonstrate what we actually did with these patients. The, the mean peak was 10 in these patients, so we put it up by 5 centimeters of water and we did a 40 by 40 long recruitment strategy. And then we did measurement, as you can see here. <clears throat> these are our results. Uh, what we found was that uh, they, there were 73% of patients in whom oxygenation improved significantly. So we call these as responders, responded for the recruitment maneuver, oxygenation improved. Now there were 30%, 25% of patients in whom uh, there was not, not a positive response. In fact, they got worse after the recruitment. Uh, oxygenation dropped significantly in these patients. And there were patients in whom oxygenation improved significantly, but less than 50%. And there were those who responded extremely well for, for uh, recruitment. About 30% of the total population had a more than 50% increase in PAO2, FiO2. And this uh, was accompanied by no change in compliance. So higher tidal volume did not cause any change in the compliance. However, in the non-responder group, there was a significant drop in compliance, indicating that just simply looking at your ventilator's um, uh, compliance data, then if there is a, um, 
a decrease in compliance, then you shouldn't do recruitment education. Highly, uh, not highly likely that won't respond for recruitment. Now this was a kind of a preliminary study, and we're going to repeat it now with transpulmonary, adding transpulmonary pressure measurements and also advanced hemodynamic monitoring to see how uh, long water, uh, what, what is the, the role of long water in this whole story. So uh, finally, let me call to Bob Kutzmarek that uh, lung recruitment is useful in improving PO2 FiO2 and recruitment maneuvers are unsafe and our study indicates that you can do that in your spontaneously breathing patients. And as I said, I do recruitment because I want to uh, recruit uh, alveoli and I want to reduce the FiO2 what I'm using in my patients. You can say that it hasn't been shown that it improves survival, but I don't care. I'm not doing this because I want to improve survival. But I follow this advice, what I rephrased from the Bhagavad Gita, that it doesn't matter whether you've done the right thing, but whether you've done everything to do the right thing. And if I do know that the patient is on high FiO2, and I know that it may be recruitable, but I don't do this because of ignorance or whatever, then I haven't done everything for my patient. So this is my conclusion. Thanks very much for listening.